Hi, I'm Abby, I have a lot of records, and this might be my Fantano moment. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and I usually talk about a classic album I love. This is not one of those weeks. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. This week's album came up in three past episodes, all in very rapid succession. The Sue Vlocky video, the Blood on the Tracks video, and the Tom Petty video. Over the course of this series, I've gotten a lot better at articulating exactly why I do and do not like things. Uh, that being said, I was still unsure if I should touch an album that a lot of people really, really love, but I don't necessarily love. I left the final decision up to you. I ran a poll on my community tab and you said yes. A resounding yes, in fact. Now, if you just want my review and nothing else, I have this video broken up into chapters. All my videos are, but fair warning, you're gonna miss a lot of context if you do skip to that portion. The people willed it, so here it is, this week's album. Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. Oh boy. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post hints to what album I'll be covering next week. I host my polls over there so you can pick episodes sometimes. It's fun stuff. I'm scared. You're scared. We're all a little scared. Let's just rip the band-aid and this plastic off. So my copy is an early repress. I got this from the record store where I went to college. I went down there to buy Paranoid and Master of Reality by Black Sabbath, saw this copy of Rumors there for $10, and thought, why the hell not? This cover art was photographed by Herbie Worthington with design by Desmond Strobel. Here we have the cartoonishly tall Mick Fleetwood across the cartoonishly small Stevie Nicks dressed in her stage garb plus her ballet shoes. We're barely into this video and we're already talking about Fleetwood Mac legend and lore. Let's talk about the crystal ball theory. So this crystal ball right there, it first appeared on the cover of the White Album, not that White Album, this White Album. This appeared to be somewhat of a good luck charm. Every Fleetwood Mac slash Stevie record with this crystal ball on it. I have these two and Belladonna right here. All those records went to number one. Then we have Mick F's good luck charm. These balls. Mick was a little sloshed at this photo shoot, right? He goes to take a whiz, goes to flush the toilet, pulls the chain too hard, and the gentle giant just rips it right out. And he puts it through the belt loop in his pants. For what reason, I'm not sure. Everyone on set thought this was so funny and it actually made the winning shot. Toilet humor aside, this is a beautiful album cover. Gorgeous Art Nouveau inspired calligraphy, beautiful shot, no notes. On Rumors, we have what many consider to be the classic era lineup of Fleetwood Mac. Of course, we have the namesake of the band, Mick Fleetwood on drums and John McVie on bass. We have Christine McVie on keys, backing vocals, and lead vocals on Don't Stop, Songbird, and Oh Daddy. Then we have the sophomore members of this band. We have one of the few rock and roll dickheads, more dickheadish than Billy Corgan, Lindsey Buckingham on vocals and guitar, and we have Stevie Nicks on vocals. There are two genres of Gemini Woman, the Stevie Nickses, and the Agents of Chaos who just want to watch the world burn. I think you know which one I am. Rumors was produced by Ken Calais, who would work with Fleetwood Mac on their next three studio records, with Richard Doshett, who'd work on all of those records, plus Tango in the Night and Time. This was engineered by Ken Calais and Chris Morris. There is, a a lot to unpack here. So, let's just roll the transition. <laughs> 
Okay, so three things to know. Number one, this lineup of Fleetwood Mac is still pretty green. They'd only put out the one record before this. Number two, this isn't a particularly stable lineup. Everybody, and I mean everybody, is getting with, breaking up with, and cheating on each other. And three, everyone was on an ungodly amount of drugs. Uh, the Fleetwood Mac relationship drama has been hashed out time and time again in deep dive videos like these. Instead, I'll be focusing on the writing and production of Rumors and how we almost didn't get this album. Sessions for Rumors take place across six months, from February to August of 1976, with the brunt force taking place at the Sausalito location of the record plant. Part of why these sessions were so drawn out was because Fleetwood Mac was writing this material alongside recording. The other reason was the pursuit of perfection. Lindsey Buckingham was a pop record guy, and not only did he want a really solid pop record under Fleetwood Mac's belt, he wanted it as perfect as possible. I have never heard of an album's production being so costly right out of the gate. It's said that they went through nine pianos to find something that sounded right. Meanwhile, you have Lindsay royally pissing off his equipment techs by having his acoustic restrung three times every hour while cutting Never Going Back Again. This took a whole day. They finally got all the takes right, and then Lindsay realized he was playing in the wrong key the whole time. So they had to do the whole ordeal over again the next day. And a good chunk of the budget went to funding their skiing excursions. Everyone had a wicked skiing habit at this time. Why is my nose itchy? The working title was Yesterday's Gone from a line in the song Don't Stop. The band would record in these marathon all-nighter sessions that were essentially one long, boozy, very unhappy party. You could cut the tension with a knife. This personal and interpersonal strife, plus the general frustration with the recording process, goes into the content of the album. Lindsay writes Go Your Own Way about resenting Stevie post-breakup. It's the Go and live your crappy life without me! song, as Stevie called it in the liner notes of the 2013 reissue. To get a breather from the chaos of recording, and maybe to avoid Lindsay's hissy fits, Stevie would go hang out in Sly Stone's room at the studio. Seriously, Sly's team had a bedroom built in the studio for him. Sly clearly wasn't using it at the time, so Stevie would bring her books and her notes and her arts and crafts there to kill time until she was needed. That's where she wrote her response song to Go Your Own Way, Dreams. Christine also finds a safe haven from her ex and bandmate John. On. After the all-night recording sessions, after everyone else had left, she'd hang around to just play her own compositions by herself. Ken Calais overhears one of these and goes, holy sh**, I have to get this on tape. He did Miles of Isles with Joni Mitchell a couple years before at the Berkeley Community Theater, and he wanted to do something similar for this song. Berkeley is booked already, so he brings Chris to the Zellerbach Auditorium at UCLA instead. That's where she cut Songbird, and here, the equipment techs did one of the nicest things anybody had done for anybody during these sessions. They dimmed all the lights in the auditorium and brought up the spotlight and surprised her with all these flowers on her piano. Christine was so loved. This story, I think, is perfect for explaining how such a fractured band was still able to work together during this time. Early on in the sessions, Chris presented a song fragment called Keep Me There. It was an instrumental track with an atmosphere perfect for the tension recording was marked by, but it needed a lot of work. It remained unfinished until pretty much the end of the line, and when someone remembered, hey, remember that thing 
We did. Why don't we work more on that? It needed a bridge, but no one could think of what to do, so John just sticks a bass line in there. Next, Lindsay starts noodling around with it. He adds in the guitar part from an old Buckingham Nick song, Lola My Love. Chris's Keep Me There fragment ended up being what we now know as the outro of this song. Stevie provided the lyrics, and then the song was complete. Since the completed version is essentially a bunch of songs smooshed together, Fleetwood Mac gave it a pet name, The Chain, and it just kind of stuck. As separate as crafting the building blocks of The Chain was, it ended up being a collective effort. All of Rumors was like that. Mick said, We refuse to let our feelings derail our commitment to the music, no matter how complicated or intertwined they became. It was hard to do, but no matter what, we played through the hurt. And Stevie said, What was going on between us was sad. We were couples who couldn't make it through. But as musicians, we still respected each other. That's ultimately what made Rumors happen. Although... Rumors almost didn't happen. When it came time to mix this record, Ken Rich and Company made the unfortunate discovery that the Sausalito tapes were fucked. They'd used them so much during recording that some stuff was running way too slow while others was running fast. The drum tracks were practically worn through to nothing. It was a toss-up of whether this album was going to be salvageable or not. Fleetwood Mac realizes that if they were going to have an album with which to tour with, then they had to cancel their fall 1976 tour and push the album back by at least four months. Warner Brothers calls in a specialist, uh, not sure what this title means, and I'll try to explain how these tapes were restored as best I can. So this dude was wearing a set of headphones with the damaged tapes running through the left audio channel and the safety masters, basically your backups in case a fucky wucky like this happens, in the right channel. They used what was left of the drums, or maybe they had overdubs at this point, I'm not sure, uh, but the drums were the reference point that this guy would use to either slow down or speed up the left channel to match the right. Can you imagine the ear you'd need to do that? While I said band politics didn't bleed into Fleetwood Mac's ability to make music together, it did bleed into what songs made the final cut. Stevie wrote a song called Silver Springs about Lindsay, and this song was her baby. She really believed in this one and fought really hard to have it included on Rumors. But as the final track listing was being ironed out, they had one problem. Even though Stevie had shortened Silver Springs, it was still too long for the space on the record they had. Remember, the primary music format at this time was vinyl. You needed the space on the record for these songs. Uh, Lindsay goes through the Buckingham Knicks songbook, picks out a poppier shorty, I don't want to know, for consideration in hopes that Stevie will be okay with it. She wasn't. Lindsay tells her that Silver Springs has been cut in favor of I Don't Wanna Know, and she was heartbroken. To add insult to injury, Silver Springs was relegated to the B-side of Go Your Own Way, the song Lindsay wrote about her. In the end, 11 songs made the cut for rumors. The final track listing goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have secondhand news, followed by dreams. Then, never going back again. Next, don't stop. Then, go your own way. And side one ends with songbird. Opening up side two, we have the chain, followed by you make loving fun. Then, I don't want to know. Next, Oh Daddy, and the album concludes with Gold Dust Woman. Rumors is released in February of 77 and is supported by a wildly successful tour through the summer. This thing broke records, I believe it was the highest selling record that year, and continues to be Fleetwood Mac's best selling album. The McVees divorce is at times overshadowed by the on again, off again, much more emotionally volatile Buckingham Knicks breakup, but 
both of those overshadow Mick Fleetwood's fling with Stevie Nicks in 77. In which, wouldn't you know it, he also cheated on his wife. Who was the wife? Layla's sister, Jennifer Juniper herself, Jenny Boyd. Mick F and Stevie really blossomed while on tour for this record, but the seed was no doubt planted during production. 20 years after this album's release, something really cool happens that I like to call Silver Springs Revenge. Unless you were a hardcore Fleetwood Mac fan or you had the Go Your Own Way single and bothered to listen to the B-side, you probably didn't know about Silver Springs. In 1997, this lineup of Fleetwood Mac performs a reunion show. It's recorded for a live album called The Dance. They perform Silver Springs for the first time ever, and people go nuts over it. It's released as a single, it's nominated for Grammys, and it becomes a Fleetwood Mac fan favorite. Now, if you own subsequent re-releases of Rumors, if you have a digital release, you're probably gonna have Silver Springs on it. Rumors has a legacy like few records I've covered on this series, and that's saying a lot because I have covered a lot of iconic albums. Like so many other albums I've covered on this series, I am a child of divorce! Rumors is in the canon of all-time great breakup albums. Oh, and it inspired cultural juggernaut book-to-TV series Daisy Jones and the F***ing Six. Loved the book. Not crazy about the show. And just like that, the time has come. What do I think of Rumors? <laughs> I have thoughts. Not only do I have thoughts, I have feelings. So usually in this section of the video, I do a track by track breakdown of the album, but uh, very early on, I realized I had to go about this section of the video differently. Before I get into my very mixed feelings on Rumors, I want to highlight its greatest strengths. That's what I've done with every other album on this series. I don't see why I shouldn't now. No, I'm not going to totally rip into rumors just because you're a misogynistic weirdo who doesn't like that a blues band went in a more female-fronted pop direction like 10 years after they'd formed. They were going pop long before Buckingham Nicks, in fact. See, the Danny Kerwin and the Bob Welch eras. You know, Fleetwood Mac has always been shaped in the image of the women who surrounded it. That was a wonderful strength as they evolved through the years. First, we had Peter Green's girlfriend, the one who inspired Black Magic Woman. Then came Christine. We have those couple songs that Jenny Boyd co-wrote, and finally, most famously, the arrival of Stevie. The second biggest strength through the Buckingham Knicks era of Fleetwood Mac was the songwriting. I appreciate the variety of perspectives on rumors. All right, this is Suvlaki by Slow Dive. I called this one the 90s rumors. Suvlaki's greatest pitfall, in my opinion, is that it's very much the Neil Halstead show. We get a lot of what Neil thinks and how Neil feels, except for Suvlaki's space station, where we finally hear from Rachel. That doesn't happen with rumors. We have three formidable writers on this thing and three unique points of view. Firstly, we have Lindsay, who's maybe the most objective writer. He more or less just says how he feels. And he is bitter. I'm just secondhand news and asking how can I give you my world if you won't take it from me. As short as Never Going Back Again is, it's just seven lines, he outright admits he's stuck in a cycle. If you like a writer who's an open book, this guy is your guy. Then we have Stevie. She was the stage presence that Fleetwood Mac needed to hit mainstream success and eventually icon status. You want an open book? Not Stevie. 
Her writing style is far less direct than Lindsay's. She entirely conceals her feelings in her words. It's rooted heavily in imagery, crystal visions, and the like. And her songs give a lot for a listener to chew on. On my second listen through, I hit a point where I was like, wow, okay, I've stopped Stevie songs and gone back for certain phrases so much that I really should just have the lyric sheet out. Stevie's openness comes more from her vocal delivery. I'll get into this later. And we have Christine. I love Christine. She gives the bright spots desperately needed on this album with delicate, sweet songbird and joyous, you make loving fun. Never underestimate the power of the alto. And Don't Stop, the original title track, if you will. That's where Yesterday's Gone came from. Lindsay and Chris were an underutilized combo. Their vocal blend was bar none. Now it might seem simple to you, but I found this Stevie penned lyric to be the crux of rumors. Now you tell me that I'm crazy. It's nothing that I didn't know. All of the narrators on rumors are trying to discount each other's feelings. It's a cacophony of no to listen to her, man, my ex is crazy. He's just saying that because he's an asshole. This can get juicy juvenile and irritating, but when it's good, it's fascinating. All of my favorite breakup records retain some kind of rough around the edges quality, even if they are highly produced. See? Blood on the tracks. Here we come upon my greatest hang up with rumors, something I've taken to calling manufactured magic. I feel Rumors exemplifies the pitfalls of 70s pop rock production. It can get thin. It's too done up. Now don't get me wrong, Suvlaki was heavily produced. This thing is a feat of modern engineering. Where Suvlaki's production conveys the emotional strife, the Rumors production throws a wet blanket on it. It needlessly rounds out the edges. The most stifled song, don't come for me. Dreams. Yawn, honk, shoo, it's too pretty, too restrained, Stevie's too reserved. Christine, I love you, but the synth keys combo in the beginning of Don't Stop is so cheesy. It's giving doctor's office waiting room. And the chimes in You Make Loving Fun. It's just a little too on the nose and a little too cutesy. At its worst, Rumors' manufactured magic stifles the real true magic that can come from this venting and catharsis happening in the writing. It hinders most tracks on Rumors in some way. Now this point is why you shouldn't have skipped ahead in this video. I can't I can't help but wonder if Rumors' thinness came from the overuse of and subsequent efforts to fix the tapes. The more you play it, the more it loses depth. I feel like this record is remixed and remastered once every five years, and the sound just gets thinner and weaker every time. I can always tell when a band had fun making their record. with. Suvlaki, as miserable as Slow Dive was, they have fond memories of making this one. The Rumors period was so devoid of joy and sessions were so messy that making such a clean record out of it feels off. I know how great a sloppier Buckingham Nicks Fleetwood Mac was. I prefer Tusk over Rumors because it's looser. I prefer the vast majority of this album's material live, especially Dreams. I like Buckingham Nick's Fleetwood Mac when they lose their composure, get mad, aren't afraid to sound a little ugly. I prefer a final product with aesthetic blemishes like that because I can feel it. For that reason, I'm seeking out the RSD 2020 alternate rumors, and I might pre-order the rumors live album coming in September. Production doesn't hinder every song quite as badly. Secondhand news good, actually. I saw some people knocking this one in the comments of my poll, but it's a good opener. It's composed and intentional exposition. It's like the curtain rising on this record. I love the writing. I hate the guitar tone. The uber clean production actually works to Never Going Back Again's benefit. The waves of 
blues are like the Greek chorus of this push and pull tragedy. Great guitar work, very technical. I've heard this shit is impossible to play. I like Go Your Own Way, but I love how it speeds ahead of itself. That's the power that the syncopation and Lindsay's solos have. Songbird is one of my favorite Fleetwood Mac songs ever for how no frills it is. They just let Chris be Chris. It's just her and a piano. And you make loving fun. It's warm and fuzzy like a cup of coffee on a chilly morning. The studio recording that's least stifled is The Chain. If CCR's got a bad moon on the rise, or whatever the hell John Fogarty was saying, Fleetwood Mac had a bad sun on the rise with The Chain. It feels like a gritty Mexican standoff, and when you saw a video of this song live, it really was. I wish pop music was still daring, like that bridge into the freewheeling outro. It feels like the wheels are gonna come off at any moment now. I love those moments in music. The chain f***ing rips because everyone was actually on the same page. Production was concerned with having a whole side of slow songs. That's part of the reason Silver Springs didn't make it. I think they should have been more concerned with sequencing. This album's sequencing is whack. Never Going Back Again disrupts any and all potential momentum built by dreams. I hadn't listened to Rumors in a while before this. I remembered liking Songbird, but I didn't remember where it was. I actually got so frustrated with the continual foot on the gas, foot on the brakes of the sequencing that come Songbird after Go Your Own Way, I was so frustrated I screamed. After covering Blood on the Tracks, I've come to understand why a scattered track listing can benefit a breakup album. The listener doesn't get to get comfortable, feelings are nonlinear, blah blah blah. With the batch of songs they picked, Fleetwood Mac and company picked pacing over sequencing. And with the batch of songs they had, that might have been their only choice. Now, I hate to say this about Silver Springs because I love its story of resiliency, but Ken and Rich were right. 1976 Silver Springs wasn't fit for the OG Rumors track listing. Silver Springs needed to marinate in 20 years of resentment and anger. Stevie needed to get pissed to give this song the vitriol it needed. The original recording was too sad. And her voice wasn't mature enough to deliver this song the way it needed to be. There are some choices I like, though. Opening side two with the chain after closing side one with Songbird is actually really compelling. As soon as you're feeling some sense of security and peace and you can take a breath, haha, <laughs> nope, just kidding, it's ripped away from you. I seek rawness in a breakup album, not just with the production, but with writing too. That's where Joni Mitchell's Blue or its counterpart, Graham Nash's Songs for Beginners shine. When production doesn't trample all over it, Rumors has that quality too. Here is where I want to spotlight Rumors' other two aha moments, the ones that aren't the chain. First, Oh Daddy. I've seen this song consistently ranked in the bottom half of people's Rumors song rankings. I don't agree with this. It's a valuable point of view here. All of the narrator's self-worth comes from the man in her life. Uh, she resents his perfection. Her plight is unique because it departs from the outright and rampant self-destruction and equally powered toxicity happening on Rumors. This on Oh Daddy is a clear power imbalance. It's one of the darkest corners of Rumors along with Gold Dust Woman. Oh Daddy's pairing with Gold Dust Woman is f***ing fascinating, and I kind of love that the scorned women get the last word. Gold Dust Woman's production, it's like psych for the 70s, clouded in this thick, thick smoke. I want to spotlight the line, rock on gold dust woman, take your silver spoon, dig your grave. This is a perfect example of the duality of Stevie's writing. In one interpretation, it could mean charmed woman, you have the luck of the devil, and you did nothing to earn it. That'll be your undoing. 
On the other hand, it could mean rock and roll woman, your coke addiction is probably gonna kill you. Either way you interpret that line, you still get the same outcome, a picture of a self-destructive woman. Rulers make bad lovers, you better put your kingdom up for sale. You were a tyrant, but not anymore, because I know my worth. There's a constant swapping of subject uh, back and forth from singing to another woman, to singing about herself, to singing about this man. The dragon is the woman and her anger and her addiction. There's some ugliness in this recording too. Stevie's bleats and cat scratch wails. But again, I love Buckingham Nick's Fleetwood Mac most when they're not afraid to lose their bearings and not be so pristine. When I sat down and I thought of what really makes a good breakup album for this video, and when I mulled over Gold Dust Woman, I realized all great breakup albums have a damn good closer. Blue has The Last Time I Saw Richard. Blood on the Tracks has Buckets of Rain. Suvlaki, buried somewhere in here, has Dagger. All of these songs are magic in their own ways, but Gold Dust Woman might hold the most powerful magic of all. There could have been a whole album of Gold Dust Woman moments. Through this glimmer, this flickering flame, I see the massive potential this thing had, and I, after something like this, I can't help but be so disappointed. With rumors, I feel like I'm holding a Da Vinci, a wonderful, culturally significant piece of work, but this Da Vinci was painted over a Ghirlandaio. A more primitive rumors would have been a more understated genius, sure, but looking across my personal preferences. The Beatles' White Album, Glyn Johns' Get Back, Their Satanic Majesty's Request. I lean towards something less polished. I want the record that might challenge some with its genius. I'm gonna want the Ghirlandaio. At the end of the day, this is a great collection of songs. The emotions here had a lot of potential, that which I feel was realized in every subsequent iteration. I like the songs, I don't like how the majority of them were recorded. I like the songs, but I don't like rumors. Moral of the story, feel your feelings. Allow the listener to feel your feelings. Use the studio to highlight that. Don't use the studio to mop the mess up. And last but most certainly not least, don't f your bandmates. My personal favorites on this one are Secondhand News, Go Your Own Way, The Chain, Oh Daddy, and Gold Dust Woman. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it. That's why I don't like rumors. I can't take any credit for the Lindsey Buckingham Bill Hader joke. That was all my buddy Mark. I hope I've articulated my feelings on rumors the best I can. I trotted and at times suffered through this thing because you all wanted this and I love you. The things I do for love. But what do you think? of this album. What do you think of Fleetwood Mac? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about the albums I can't say love, talk about. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. This is going to be an exciting month ahead in Vinyl Monday land. You won't want to miss out. I post new episodes every Monday morning at 11. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.